Okay. And then I will hide the MIDI controls. Hello everyone, once again. Welcome back. My name is Henri J. Benali, here at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I work under the professor, distinguished McKnight University professor, Jin Ping Wong, who is my principal investigator. And basically, our group is called the Nanomagnetism and Quantum Spintronics Lab, and we work on quantum spintronics. I focus heavily on fabrication, so today I'm going to be showing some images, slides, and some animations on the lithography process, electron beam, you know, direct write processes like that, even laser lithography methods we use to create quantum chips. And we, we can also create quantum processors as well. We, we have some other uh, we call methods to fabricate the quantum chips, which involves like the etching, like a top-down manufacturing process. And so these these are all parts of fabricating a real device that you can hold in your hand, so long as you have training. So let's move on. So this for, as far as the table of contents, basically we're going to go over the background of of some basic concepts regarding the direct write processes and even the the what is considered the masked lithography processes and then we're going to go over sort of like the what the design aspects are and where you can get some inspiration from and then we can also talk about a comparison of like the direct process, direct right lithography or electron beam lithography, laser lithography, ion beam lithography, whatever you want. So long as there's a beam that you can control, you can compare it with a 3D printing uh, methods for 3D printing and even CNC machining, which are these are these are pretty common manufacturing methods that you can compare it with and try to understand it from there. They're very similar to each other. It's just that one, some are more complicated. <laughs> and then as far as massless direct light writes, uh, lithography methods are many compared to just the projection-based lithography methods. And then, of course, the ion beam exposure, like the, the actual slicing of the chips themselves. Mm. And we'll talk about the equipment advantages and disadvantages, sort of briefly go over those and then some examples of chips that I've built using these kind of systems. And I will get to your conclusion. So here on the on the right side, a little image that I that I a picture that I took in the laboratory. This is a micro patterned hull bar device. So this is a magnetic device, nanomagnetic device that's been patterned with uh, ultraviolet lithography, mask lithography. And we are examining it under this scanning electron uh, microscope. So you can actually use this microscope if you wanted. To, you could add extra features, hardware, and turn this microscope into a lithography system. It, all it requires is that you modify the electron gun and some software, control software, things like that. And then you can increase the beam exposure so that it can actually add enough energy to the features of this device. And based off of those feature exposures, you can create a specific pattern, which has been, which you design in on your, on your PC, on your, on your laptop, your desktop machine, whatever you like, you can put any pattern on there, even words, letters, pictures. I'll show you some examples of those. You can do that with something like this. So there, there are many different directions you can go as far as hardware, but this is just one such example. This is, in this case, uh, specifically called a, called a cryogenic electron microscope, this system here in our laboratory. So um, here on the background and motivation here, we can see there's a, like an, a, a comparison of the different frequencies and wavelengths that we deal with when we're trying to create nanoscale structures 
that are exposed by some beam of energy. So in this case, when we are working with optical lithography, projection methods and things like that, such as what's done in industry, you can use ultraviolet photon exposure and the, the wavelength of that ultraviolet light can can actually reach nanoscale features if you if you can produce a specific wavelengths of ultraviolet light. And that's that's been done using extreme ultraviolet lithography. And so that's what they call it. And there is also maskless ultraviolet lithography. This one's mostly uh, for micro pattern features, but regardless, we, we use these methods to quickly create electrodes, some, some other larger features that are still needed for a quantum device. Because quantum devices, in order to interface with them, you still need micro scale features that you can interface with. And that's how it's done. And then electron beam lithography, here is a little animation of an electron beam being scanned across a chip. Here's a wafer here. And that electron beam is controlled by some uh, what, what is called electron optics. It's just a, it's just a magnetic coil, magnetic, electromagnetic coil that's being uh, controlled, that's being used to control this. And uh, here I put, you can get these really small resolution features with electron beam lithography, or even smaller if you like, technically. You can go down to like a nanometer, or try to go less than, less than a nanometer with electron beam lithography. And doing these kind of advanced direct right lithography methods requires a lot of skill. And when you go into the laboratory, typically you learn how to do micro patterning first. You do mask lithography, which is kind of like working with a stencil. You just kind of expose this area of light, either done through projection or through contact alignment. You just directly place that stencil feature on here and then expose the ultraviolet light on top of it. That's something you can do and you can get some microscope features to pattern some kind of nano nanoscale thin film. And then you move on from there. And then the more you learn in the laboratory, more time you spend in the laboratory, years go by, you start to learn more advanced methods like these, which take more time and the design process a bit more extensive, things like that. And yeah, it's just continuous learning, really, as always. And then here's um, an example of a, a GIF. This is an animation that was produced by the Zeiss Group. And they show a lithography pro photo lithography process from the very beginning. Basically, they take this wafer here, they slice the wafer from a chunk of silicon, and then polish the wafer. And after the wafer is cut and it's, you know it's it's good to go in the laboratory, you can spin coat it, add this photopolymer, which will allow you to keep those tiny nanoscale patterns or even micro patterns and expose it with some energy beam. And then after doing after doing the exposure, you can actually sort of uh, remove, will allow you to, oh dear, let me go back. The unexposed areas will allow you to uh, basically uh, come in here and then you can try to etch the unexposed areas with a, with an uh, either focused ion beam or Actually, not focus on the, uh, what is called a reactive ion etching, or maybe even just an ion milling process, which is a dry etching method. And then you can use that process over and over again with lithography and do etching again over and over. And then you can uh, basically create these chips out of it and then place it onto a packaging. Here's a, an example of the chip that's been patterned and then it's been placed into a, a packaging. So the packaging here is just like the, the metal pieces that's placed on top of the chip so that it can protect the chip. And then it can be soldered or uh, glued onto some other chip that it can interface with. If you're building some kind of process out of it. So that's just an example. But here, here's uh, something I wanted to introduce, which is related to uh, fractal curves, because fractal curves these are just little self-repeating patterns. Some are, some patterns like these are non-repeating, 
but many of them are repeating. You can you can zoom in more and more smaller and smaller into these features, and they seemingly go on forever. And these are you can actually write equations from these different kind of fractal patterns, and you can find these um, certain patterns in nature itself. So you can typically find them in like different kinds of fruits and vegetables. You can find them in hurricanes. Uh, people make these memes about uh, fractal curves or even something like a Fibonacci sequence kind of thing. So these, these are all inspired from nature. And you, a, big, a, a really big familiar one is the snowflakes. You can look at an ice crystal under a microscope, a snowflake in this case. And then you can see the snowflake has these fractal patterns, these little features that seemingly go on and on, and it's, it's a never-ending pattern. And these are, these are considered plane filling curves, because even though it takes up a small area on a, on a surface, you can actually zoom into it further and further, and it, it'll fill up space uh, the more you, you try to examine the features. So there, there's a website here called fractalcurves.com, which is basically a taxonomy of all of these different kind of uh, curves. This is called a Gosper curve, which is one of my favorites. And then there's another one called a Hilbert curve, which is similar to this one here. And uh, you can uh, study those. And uh, there's a famous one called a Julia set fractal, which was inspired by, or which was basically written about or published by Mandelbrot, a guy by the name of Mandelbrot. And then you can see here when we exam when we try to examine or design a chip, we can think of them as like having these features that are sometimes they got self-repeating patterns or they have features on there that are, are really small. And then when we try to create an architecture out of them into a larger architecture like this, they they have these uh, configurations that are taken from all these mathematical methods that are inspired sometimes from nature. So in this case, this spin this is called a spin qubit array. There are different kinds of uh, devices that are pattern and design. So this is just a two D design shown on a two D diagram, but. There are devices like these single electron transistors located here, for example, that have nanoscale features. And when you create all of these features in this big pattern like this for, for each individual cell, then uh, you can name it whatever you like, whatever you wish, whatever is on your mind. And in this case, this one's called a spider qubit array. Spider qubit, spider from nature. <laughs> so, this is what the inspiration is from. And now, when we, go, when we move on to like the design features of, of actually going into the clean room, into the laboratory, typically when we are doing a, like a direct write lithography process, it, it often involves taking some kind of CAD program, like a 2D design program in a computer. And basically what you do is you take that 2D design program you convert it into a compatible file format that, that will go into this thing called a GDS. The GDS will allow you to read that file and then turn it into separate layers that can be identified by a machine. And then, but, but, but before you upload it into the machine, you need to convert it into another file format that will, that will be compatible with, with that. So there are like multiple stages that you have to take care of or be aware of when you're using this kind of equipment. So uh, you can actually use this slide if you want, if you're learning to do electron beam lithography. <laughs> and then of course, on the actual machine, the electron beam lithography machine, or even, or, or basically any other direct write lithography machine, you can take a, you, you can take a design pattern upload it, do all these conversions here from a basic 2D diagram. And then you can try to convert it into code. So in this case, this is a, a Linux based system. So all of the Linux code, you have to write it down on the side in a notebook and then record it 
and then write write those codes one by one into this terminal. So the terminal is just like sort of an interface that, that you can try to use to uh, control this electron beam lithography system. So all of the commands are done here, just uh, as you would expect from a Linux system. <laughs> so, so these these are uh, different ways of, of of basically doing direct write patterning. And then here, uh, there's an example that I made. This is that same machine that I'm talking about, electron beam lithography. And here's an example of a chip that, that we fabricate in our laboratory. And there's, there's actually some interesting parallelisms between using this kind of system versus doing 3D printing or doing CNC machining. So these are, these are all different ways of so autonomously controlling a, either a beam or a probe or, or some kind of milling head that will allow you to take some initial measurements. So I highlighted this here in blue. There are some blue squares. These blue squares represent these reference points. So, so if you have a chip, basically, you, you have to create a reference point, an initial reference point. And the initial reference point will allow you to uh, focus either a beam of energy or the probe, like I said, or uh, a milling head on, a, on a, um, a system like this. In this case, a CNC machine, 3D printing head, and electron beam lithography uh, scanning raster beam. So in this case, the reference point will allow you to like go back and forth and keep keep the beam uh, well aligned so that nothing goes off course or that if you wanted to if you needed to move this feature over to the right uh, right side of the chip maybe somewhere in this region or if the chip is much bigger than that maybe you need to have some reference points on there that will allow you to uh, move across much much more easier and then you can track the movements on this machine and that can be automated so Again, you, you basically create a 2D diagram, or um, in this case for 3D modeling, you create a 3D diagram, a 3D uh, file format, such as an STL or a, uh, let's see, what's, what's the other one, OBJ file format. And once you do, once you uh, create such a file format that is output from a, a PC, then you can upload it into a, into a, software converter which will create what is called a g code so each of these machines here that you see even for laser so if we were to replace this electron beam lithography with a laser lithography system or a scanning probe lithography system then they all still use some form of g code specifically the for 3d printing and cnc machining they both use specifically g code and electron beam lithography, they don't call it a G-code, but it is a kind of G-code that has a coordinate system. So the coordinate system has all these coordinates where the, where the beam needs to move or the probe needs to move. Or if you're, you're controlling the milling head on the CNC machine, they, they all use this coordinate system. So the coordinates are all generated or recorded in this G-code. So that's what it is. If you can create a G code, a kind of G code, then then you have basically a set of instructions. It's it's kind of like a basic algorithm for the machine, a set of instruction for the machine to follow. You can move around if you need to expose something here or extrude a piece of plastic or maybe something else like carbon fiber into a specific area. All of that is done by instruction called g-code so g-code 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 it's just a naming scheme <laughs> so that's that's really all really all it is and then you of course right here here's the design profile it's a, an example of some some uh, fractal curves that i designed in autocad and then i converted it into a g-code which i actually created on uh, one of the laser chips i didn't put it here it's it's laser etched but i just wanted to show that example. And again, here is an example of a maskless direct writing for electron beam lithography. 
you have like a specific beam exposure, you have to set the dosage amount, and then you do some rough alignment. So what does that mean? Rough alignment means you measure the reference points and record those coordinates on this chip. And then whatever you make on there, those rough alignment features, whatever you select um, will be recorded on paper. Then whatever you record here and remember, or even type out, you can then upload it onto the lithography system itself. And then it will use a scanning electron beam to look at the nano features or even the microscale features and try to locate those coordinates. You can either use uh, a piece of code to try to uh, automatically identify the locations of, of where those reference points are, or you can manually do it, manually locate those coordinates simply by enter, entering the locations or the relative locations on the machine itself. And then once you find the reference, the, the, actual, the real reference points, the, the more accurate reference points, then you can record them as what is uh, as a marker position, this thing called a marker position, and then you record on the, uh, in this case, Linux code, <laughs> Linux script. And then after that, you can upload this final piece of code way at the end. It's much longer than this, but you copy that code into the terminal, and then you can do uh, exposure. You can start to write or expose the electron beam or even laser beam. You can do something similar to this for laser lithography. It's more or less the same process. So what is electron beam lithography? I'm talking about all these beams, right? So the basic operating principle here is that, you know, you have, you actually are familiar with some, some electron beam technology. Electron beam technology, like I mentioned, electron optics has been around for quite some time. And it's been around actually since the invention of the vacuum tube. So here's an example, a little animation of a cathode and an anode inside of this. So this is called a cathode ray tube. And this is a, a GIF animation showing that this, this ray tube is fed with a high voltage input. So there's like a little big transformer inside of here. And there's a big transformer inside chunky transformer, I should say, not necessarily big, but it's fairly chunky. And that transformer will, will turn this AC voltage from your wall outlet into some high voltage. And then the high voltage will allow you to create a beam inside of this cathode tube. And then if you create another or set another, um, create a set of wounded electromagnetic coils, it's just wires, you just wound the wires around here, or even some kind of uh, plate or something similar to that. The basic principle is that if you want to apply, if you were to apply that electric field or electromagnetic field this between this between these two regions, then you can actually control where that electron beam will go. So you can move that around onto a surface. So in this case, for a television set, if you want to watch TV, then what happens is you have a signal which is being modulated here. So the modulator, modulated signal is just basically a signal that's that's going to be amplified onto this coil here, electromagnetic coil. It's just a wire, it's just wounded up wire. And then when you apply that signal uh, voltage that's being fed in from like a, either a radio signal or not radio signal, but like a a TV based signal or like maybe a signal from RCA cables or coaxial cable or maybe fire op fiber optic, which is coming from a VCR set or tape recorder or something. Basically, whatever, if you have some video that's available and then that can be encoded into an electrical signal, the electrical signal can be fed to here and then that will allow you to move this beam across the screen and then you can excite these little phosphorus coatings inside of the cathode too. And then you can start to create an image. So that's the basic operating principle. And this is actually, like I said, it's very common. You can see CRT cathode ray tubes everywhere. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty uh, old technology, but it's still, it's still useful, still around. You can even find them in some oscilloscopes.
And that's the same thing for electron beam lithography systems or scanning electron microscopes. They all use some electron beam and this so-called condenser lens here that's set up. These are just electromagnetic coils. It's just wires wound it up in this in, in different configurations. And if you add a voltage or modulating signal, you can try to control that beam and confine the beam. You can you can actually spread out the the width of the electron beam or you can try to uh, focus that electron beam onto onto this surface area. So the surface area, the specimen here could be like a chip, it could be some like a sample, whatever you want on a stage. And then whatever um, beams that are reflected off of that can be converted back into another electrical signal, which goes into like a, a, a video, it turns into a video signal or an image signal that we can display on a screen. <laughs> so that's one way of doing of explaining electron beams. So you can use this to finally, finally tune or finally control this beam of energy. And that beam of energy can easily be manipulated or modulated here, or even amplified by a series of coils and uh, transformers. And that's the same thing we do here. So like on the left side, you can see here's a pattern that I designed in AutoCAD. So this is an array of devices which is used for uh, making a tunnel junction. A tunnel junction is just a kind of device. You have a, a tunnel barrier in the middle, and then the tunnel barrier is very tiny inside of these devices, will allow you to control the electron tunneling. So you want to control the tunneling of electrons or some other uh, wave, then you, you can do that by creating these devices like this. It's tiny. So there, there are many on this on this image here, but the the individual device itself is is about that small. And then you convert that into the computer code, and that computer code, the uh, the G code, and all that will allow you to manipulate the beam inside of that uh, lithography system, and then you can start to control and write features and expose the features of this. You can create a pattern. So this is on the right side a uh, microscope image that I took of these little pads on the tunnel juncture itself. I didn't put a scale bar here. I should have put. It. These are uh, these pads are a couple of microns wide, but the actual nanoscale features are right there in the center. You can't really see it, but it's there. So what does that mean? Basically, we. When we when we get to this point, this uh, lithography part, before we get to the lithography, doing lithography, we need to actually deposit or grow the materials. In this case, metal, or you can even grow nitrides or oxides, whatever kind of material you wish that is compatible inside of a vacuum system. So you can do that. You can expose. Um, you can expose a sort of uh, plasma energy inside of here and the plasma energy will allow you to focus the focus that beam of energy or ionize the these uh, gas particles inside like argon particles or some some other uh, noble noble gas gas molecules so the the molecules of of gases here they're just atoms a bunch of atoms that are hitting the surface of this in this case metal so let's let's pretend this is gold here it looks kind of yellow but let's pretend it's gold and then we wanted to coat this uh wafer up here with gold what we do is we place the gold here we take a plasma energy we we ionize the molecules of, of gas inside of here noble gas and then what happens is it will start to bounce bounce off or in, in a way, a very complicated way of spray painting atoms of gold onto the surface here. So that energy is enough to, to create um, thin films or layers of metal here at a very slow rate. You can control it like on a scale of angstroms per second or like atomic layers per second. So you can do like one atomic layer per second or 
something something like that you can uh, you can grow material and then um, when you want to do lithography it's more or less a similar process you're doing it with again with argon ion beams and then you expose this area using some kind of uh, accelerator it's like an accelerating voltage which creates somewhat of a plasma similar to this and it will actually start to etch away the material the, the material of course being etched away is is the unpatterned areas whereas the pattern area here is done by lithography so you can design whatever you like this is the design here that's been created with uh, software and then the design after lithography will leave you something like this which creates a protective layer and then whatever is unprotective whatever is unprotected in this gray area or this this red area that is going to be exposed to some some energy beam which will etch it away you can see the animation here on the right it's just a repeating process over and over again, layers and layers on top of each other uh, of things being etched away, being grown, layers of metal on top of each other, or even oxides, nitrides, and, and some other exotic materials. And then you can finally create a, a complex chip. So that's how it's done. And again, here's the example of the lithography system. Uh, you've seen these already. I explained that. But here on the right side, here's an example of a scanning probe lithography. This is like a, it's just a very sharp tip of metal or some other, some other tip of uh, material. It's, it's uh, compatible with, with doing probe lithography. And then you can use that probe lithography system along with either some uh, resonating frequency, or you can try to do a laser beam. And then you can you can use the laser beam to sort of monitor what's happening on the chip itself, and then it can try to create features here. Now even nanoscale features. I'll show you some images of what that looks like. <laughs> so here's some other interesting methods. Maybe you've never heard of it before, but you can actually use eggs to do electron beam lithography and even ultraviolet lithography. So there's this sort of new method new tech sort of new area of exploration which involves trying to use more sustainable material to create chips so we already have chips that that use recyclable metals uh, that we can take from a recycling center and then try to purify it and then place it back into a, a manufacturing facility for building chips and so we can try to extend that mindset over to using um, photolithography or what do you call it using the polymer resist so typically in a lithography system you have to create a protective layer on top right so that protective layer is going to be exposed to maybe ultraviolet light or an electron beam so in order to do that you, you need some kind of polymer <laughs> and typically the polymers that we use in the laboratory they're they're not they're not necessary they're not exactly safe to well in this case eat <laughs> so here's an example of eggs you can actually process eggs just from a grocery store go to a grocery store maybe even if you have chickens in your backyard you, and they have eggs let's say you wanted to build a lithography system at home and let's say you knew how to build a control system that will expose a laser beam to this area or maybe use a control system to expose a, I don't know, a probe or something. Then you can do that by introducing uh, eggs. You can create that photolithography, that photopolymer resist layer on top, protective layer using eggs. And then once that's done, it's spin coated on top of this chip, then you can actually have a chip that's been coated with egg whites. And then the egg whites when they're further developed, you can just develop with water. It only requires water to develop this, this egg white resist. And then after you expose it with the electron beam or even a, a ultraviolet light, then you can start to create these microscale features or even nanoscale features. I'll, I'll show you the nanoscale features in the next slide. So here, here's that same, from that same paper showing an electron beam exposure on this area. Here's a letter S shape right here. 
here's some more letter s in in u and then it's been exposed with this beam of energy and then after it's been exposed it's the uh the process continues and you have to develop with water water is just there to flush out all of the unexposed areas so that way you can take this to uh, an ion beam system or even do some some kind of wet etching with acids things like that but regardless you can do something similar to this and uh, you can create uh, nanoscale features here you can see like 60 nano 60 nanometer fine features done with uh, spin coating egg whites <laughs> so this is just one interesting method to know because there are many different kind of resist coatings spin coating layers that exist out there on the market and they're expensive but they're also toxic and you have to have a special processing facility for just for using those kind of uh, photoresist or e-beam resist or whatever whatever kind of resist you're using not very safe but here we can use an alternative just one example there are many many other approaches you can try to explore on their own and then here's an example instead of exposing a single beam you can actually try to uh, split that beam up a larger beam into smaller beams and then that electron beam uh, will allow you to more more precisely control uh, some small areas on the chip without having to do the same process over and over again on this on this one area you can do it across multiple areas on one giant chip on a giant substrate a giant uh, foundation layer of silicon or silicon oxide or maybe even magnesium oxide whatever you wish but basically here again this is an electron beam it's being controlled by this condenser lens it's just a series of um, electromagnetic coils or micro patterns electronic features and then you can try to focus that beam into an area and then that beam will allow you to expose multiple areas in a single shot so within just either a few seconds or, or something like that you can create these features here that are like on the order of maybe 10 microns or even sub micron level um, features on the on the chip and so here's a scanning electron microscope image of such a feature that's been patterned with this multi-beam electron uh, direct writing electron beam based direct writing system so here's a generic stat, stand or standard fabrication flow that i made so here again you have a beam exposure on top so in this case for doing micro patterning you can create ultraviolet exposure and then here's a photoresist or whatever whatever compatible resist is with that beam wavelength so the, in this case you want to do ultraviolet exposure you need to use photoresist but if you're doing extreme ultraviolet lithography then you use some kind of other photoresist but after that when you expose the beam to this area it will allow you to uh, get ready for development development again just means you're washing away all these extra features that have not been exposed to the beam itself and then when that happens that will allow you to take it to an argon ion beam system to slice off the excess layers so you can see here i removed the excess pieces of metal that have been grown on top of the substrate and then when you do when you go down to nanoscale features you you need to do another protective layer on top of that and then when you want to create even smaller features here like this then you do another development after exposing the beam and then after that excess resist or protective material is removed and then you can expose it to this etching ion beam this argon ion beam it's just a beam of energy meant to etch away or sort of cut away a very very thin layer or cut away at uh, all of the layers here that you that you've grown onto a substrate and then from there you can add as many oxide protective layers as you wish so it's just an example and then you can make a final device at the end 
And then here's uh, an example of this uh, e-beam lithography that's been used to create a photo mask. So here is a here's a marker itself. So this is a markers. These are just reference points. There, there's actually research into exploring reference points. What kind of reference points can you use on a direct right lithography system? And here, um, this group, the Yoon group, basically created this pattern that has a uh, looks like two arrows facing each other. And then the beam will allow you to uh, sort of more finely or focus the positions on the very center of this of these two arrows facing each other. And so here's a comparison of what the sort of like a 3D drawing, actually 3D rendering of what that patterning process looks like. And then here's the scanning electron microscope image of what those features look like under under high resolution and these scale bars are about 500 microns or 500 nanometers sorry <laughs> and then here is a more or less a similar process for creating nanowires so you want to create nanowires nanowires are often used for studying uh, qubits you can create a qubit out of nanowires you can create other kinds of ele quantum electronic devices using nanowires and there, there are many ways to 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 make qubits out of different structures, but this is for a specific case in nanowire. You can use the, again this protective layer that's that will create an initial stencil, initial drawing, and when you expose the electron beam to that this uh, resist layer, protective layer, it will allow you to create um, sort of a a line or some other pattern feature that you want, and then. When you remove the excess material after exposing this beam, what will, that will allow you to basically place it into a solution, and then you can use that to to do what is called shadow lithography. Shadow lithography is just you open a you kind of open a window for this for this layer of material, and then after that's created, then you have to make sure it's clean, and then after that, you place it back into a vacuum chamber, and you have to deposit layers of metal or some other uh, material that you're trying to deposit onto it. And then after the deposition is performed, you remove the excess material, and then you're left over with this layer of material, a really straight line that's been deposited on there. And then after that, you can deposit another, do another lithography process to deposit the gold electrodes. So this is how you make a nanowire. And then here, this is that same process by the same group. Basically, you take this uh, wire area, and then after removing all the excess material, you can deposit layers of metal or maybe some other oxide material or nitride material right in the, between these two areas. And then you deposit gold on top of that using that same lithography process. And then after that, you can measure the, the uh, do some characteristics on, on this device, either electrical measurements or in this case, uh, a kind of profile. So this is just sort of a profile of what's being measured here. You can create a, a potential well, measure potential well if you wish. And then here's the example of doing laser lithography. So we have machines like this in our laboratory, which we use to create microscale features. And as I mentioned in the previous lecture, we can actually create microscale features, even though they are like 300, 400 nanometers. So if we were to create a device that has anywhere from like 100 nano, uh, greater than 100 nanometers, anything above that, that measurement level, uh, measurement scale, anything above 100 nanometers would still be considered nano, uh, what am I saying, micro scale. So you can use whatever laser um, lithography system that you wish, but regardless, you have to take, take heed or take note of the the design process, make sure all the, all the files are correct, 
nothing's in the wrong place because those doing something like that it costs money. It takes a long time to design something like that, but we can still do it. And once we get through all the inspection, then we can upload it to this machine, and then we can either do a, a projection using laser, or we can use, in this case, uh, a micro mirror. So there's a, in this case, there's a laser, there's an LED, uh, ultraviolet LED that's being focused onto this mirror, and then the mirror will allow you to sort of project images or project the pattern features one by one onto this substrate that has photo resist. Or you can do a different method, which is similar to what's showing here on this machine on the right. You can use a laser and then you have all these micro mirrors. They're tiny micro mirrors on here. It's a little MEMS device that will move around and it will, you can actually control the, the laser beam and just, just redirect the laser beam here and move that laser beam around without actually having to move the laser itself. So the laser is stationary, but the mirror, the laser is, is in principle stationary, more or less stationary. And then the mirror is the only thing that's moving the beam around. And so you get a lot greater control using this kind of system. And then you can create micro scale features on there that are even like 300, 400 nanometers. Um, it's compatible with a large number of kind of, a large number of photoresists. Even that, the egg white photoresist, you can use it in something like this and expose a laser beam there. <laughs> so that's the neat thing about it. And here's an example of a, a scanning probe system, lithography system. So here's an ex here's this uh, a portrait. Here's a picture. So the picture is taken of this guy. I forgot his name, but uh, basically the picture was converted into a G code, and then the G code was uploaded to this machine from this company Heidelberg Heidelberg Instruments. And then what they did was they were able to pattern this feature using this tiny sharp probe. You can see the atoms here is a scan, uh, tunneling electron microscope image of this uh, of this probe you can see it's about 10 nanometers wide here and it's got some other uh, nanoscale features but basically it's a very sharp tip it's it's a very it's just a few atoms wide at the tip of this needle and this this needle probe will scan this area and then it will remove all the excess resist material the dry resist material and it will leave you with this portrait that's been converted from the g-code so it's it's pretty it's a pretty nifty pretty neat system that allows you to do lithography nanoscale lithography these are nanoscale features here you can see it's just 19 microns wide but the actual features on here are nanoscale features that have been exposed to this this uh, thermal probe it's just a scanning probe it's tapping onto this area and then you can uh, make this nanoscale features and turn into a, a nice image all within about this all within a time span of about 10 minutes so it takes about 10 minutes to create this feature here whereas if you were to do electron beam lithography it'll take a take a little more time to process something like that and to do the to do the scanning as well the same machine is also it's got a built-in atomic force microscope the atomic force microscope can can essentially uh, scan this area and so this image here is from that is that uh, this probe here that's been scanning across the feature that it just made. So this is something that's advanced technology that's never been done before. And this is a desktop system. So it sits on top of your desk, like a printer almost, like an advanced nanoscale printer almost, in a, in a sense. <laughs> and it costs a lot of money. It's like, I don't know, a million dollars or something. I might be wrong, but it's pretty expensive. Because we wanted to get one for our... Uh, fabrication facility. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get one one of these days. For right now, we'll, we'll stick with the EBM electron beam system. So here's an example of some superconducting tunnel junctions. So these have been uh, patterned with, uh, I think, laser lithography system. So this is still uses that same G-code sort of method to create a pattern. So this pattern here on the left side has been made using using a software CAD software, 
or you can even generate designs like this, do some sort of some kind of generative process using computer code like Python or some other uh, method. You could even, I think you can use Qiskit Metal from IBM Quantum to try to generate patterns like this and then convert it into G code that can be patterns within the lithography system. So that's possible. And then you can create qubits. And here is the device, the qubit, it's got uh, 50 nanometer layers. And here's like, this is greater than 150 nanometers. And this is, is like 200 nanometers. And then the, the critical component here is you have a two nanometer uh, layer, a tunnel barrier, which is made of aluminum nitride. So this, this, can, this is called a all nitride Josephson junction. So these are superconducting materials. And this is a basically a superconducting qubit that's been patterned using laser lithography if I'm correct. And you can see that here, this is what the patterns look like under a microscope. And here's where the junctions lie. And you can create a quantum gate out of this. And if you string a bunch of them together and make a bigger pattern, then you can try to create a, a quantum processor out of it. Make a quantum processor out of uh, a number of quantum gates that have been patterned with laser lithography. You can more or less do something similar to this using uh, electron beam or scanning probe lithography, it's, it's more or less the same process as I explained earlier. So that's what this is. And here's an example of uh, a CMOS integrated or complementary metal oxide semiconductor integrated spin qubit array. So here's an array of donor sites that have been implanted using ion. And then the ion or, or whatever beam that they use, they can insert these little ch um, impurities that are put there on purpose. And then you can pattern, you can expose this area with lithography. So all this has been designed using lithography system that have been generated or uh, designed using some kind of uh, patterning software. And then after that, after the design is all confirmed and, and it's it's been configured and inspected, then you can try to go through this lithography process step by step, and then create this these all these complex layers that will host these spin qubit sites. And then these these G the letter G here just represents uh, it's a it's a layer of uh, metal that is that you can apply. A voltage so you can apply a voltage to each of these gates here or you can try to use these gates to detect a signal that is coming from these qubits that exist inside of the device itself so the qubits are underneath these gates and this has been manufactured in a industrial setting using these uh, components here you can see the labeling and this is a paper that they published just last year and then you can try to use these gates to read the signal of the spin up and spin down states of the qubits and then try to measure or characterize the qubits through the benchmarking, randomized benchmarking, whatever you wish upon the quantum step. So that summarizes, so this is the summari uh, summarization of today's lecture. We covered like high resolution patterning methods, which includes electron beam and others, even ultraviolet lithography, which is briefly mentioned, but regardless, we, we can take a design import and then we can uh, basically do something complex or as simple as we like. And all these are taken from inspirations, either from nature, and then we can take that inspiration even further from more common technologies that exist around us, such as CNC machines or 3D printers or like uh, something like laser cutters. So even even a printer, I, I wanted to use an example, like you have a printer in your office, a printer uses uh, a code, a kind of code that's similar to a G code, which creates its coordinates, similar to what CNC machines use and 3D printers use, because all, all it is, is you're automating a process through coordinate systems, so that you can uh, basically expose a beam or expose energy onto a chip or onto something like a piece of paper, anything you want. And then you can try to learn more and more about it. And then you can use these skills 
and transfer the skills between different kind of orthography systems, even for uh, you know focus ion beam or uh, you want to learn ion milling system, all the all these complex processes. You can become a lithography engineer using these processes <laughs> and then create qubits all all you want just uh, and even i showed some examples of how you can use some of these ideas to create like green lithography systems that are taken from eggs and you can also uh, try to look out for what kind of systems maybe you can build at home there are some youtube videos actually of people using making their own lithography systems out of projection-based equipment and, and things like that. Uh, so that's the idea. And of course, there are disadvantages like charge buildup and so like other patterning features that, that are hard to deal with as far as materials goes, material incompatibility and so forth. That's, that's something we we'll have to look out for. So uh, next week, we will talk about the hardware control, the quantum hardware. The, the CMOS components talk about the wiring diagrams, the, the general quantum stack, we'll go over it again, and then talk about some imaging methods that are used a little bit more in depth for doing this kind of uh, techniques for building qubits. And this is, this is basically <laughs> a big part of what I do, like patterning, hardware, imaging. It's a lot of fun. You should join us. <laughs> so, if anyone has any questions, I am um, open to questions, initial questions. If not, you know, when we post it on YouTube, I'll, I'll try to keep talk, I'll, I'll try to take notes and uh, write down what questions that people have. Yeah. Today's lecture is a bit more, I guess you could say, a bit more, uh, a bit more extensive, because <laughs> we're talking about all of these lithography methods at once, and there's just so many to cover. And on top of that, when you're making a qubit, uh, there's there's like a different array, different different kinds of qubits you can build. Even the photonic systems, I didn't mention that in today's lecture, but photonic chips can more or less be fabricated in a similar way. And there's one chart I wanted to show, actually. Uh, maybe I should show it here. There's one more I need to show. So I have this thing called Google Keep Notes. And I have the chart on here. It's a okay. Is this the one? Okay. Boom. This is the one. Let me let me let me open this page. I want to share this with all of you. So the other thing I wanted to show was this uh, this diagram. <laughs> this diagram basically shows like the different features that you can try to focus on. There are some other common methods like. 193 immersion lithography, 193, uh, some other different uh, lithography methods that exist in the industry. And then there's like scanning probe lithography, which can handle all these uh, feature sizes down here. This is the one other thing I wanted to show, but I didn't have time. There's a lot of things going on right now. It's, you know, when you're doing uh, PhD work, it's you know, so many things to keep track of. And when you're doing and a lot of collaboration. <laughs> Sometimes you, you can also show so much on the screen. That's the thing. But yeah, the electron beam lithography methods, they, they exist down here as well. So you can, you can compare this chart. You can use this chart as insight or as a mention of, of what we can uh, use to create qubits. You can use you can use any of these methods to create qubits basically. So it's 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 pretty straightforward. But yeah, anyways. Thanks for coming by. I'm gonna stop the recording now and uh, we'll move on.
Thanks.